I'll start to learn about React. All right, everyone, absorb. <laughs> well, before that, uh, yeah, go to Open Source North. I got tickets. It should be real fun. Also, um, use Commit to Zen. It's something I need to do more of. It's a really cool project. All right, so, hi, everybody. Hi, Dr. Nick. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Nick. Uh, my name is Nathan Smith. I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Eldermark. Uh, my Twitter handle is Nogs, and my GitHub is Nogs MPLS, because I love Minneapolis. But that's enough about me. You're not here to learn about me. You're here to learn about React, uh, specifically some of the concepts it brings to the front end uh, development environment and the ecosystem that has popped up around it. I do want to say that this is not a tutorial of React. This is covering some high-level concepts. So please, if you want to learn more of the nitty-gritty of actual examples of React and Redux in particular, do go to that NodeMN uh, meetup uh, that is happening in two weeks in June. So this is our agenda for today. First half, <clears throat> like I said, is going to be about React concepts. Uh, and it's, if you've ever seen the talk that Pete Hunt has given called Rethinking Best Practices, it's mostly, if you want to see another take on my talk, or I'm, take, I'm doing a take on his talk, rather, uh, go to that uh, link, uh, bit.ly slash react dash rethink, and he'll go into a bit more detail than I will tonight, for sure. Then we'll take a five-minute break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the ecosystem, and I'll give some suggestions on what I think you should do if you're looking into React, uh, when and how you should use it. So if you can't see the slides tonight from either angle and you have your laptop, you can go to this link, bit.ly slash jsmn dash react dash intro. And those are the slides I'm working off tonight. So if you want to see them, there they are. So we're going to start off. What is React? Well, React is a front end framework that was open sourced by Facebook in May of 2013. So it's been out for about three years now. It was developed internally at Facebook before then, so it's a little bit more than three years old. But it, the public really got a hold of React in May of 2013. And it was created for building what they call complex user interfaces. Uh, I don't know any user interfaces that are simple, uh, but it was made for complex user, user interfaces. And you can see a lot of companies using React nowadays in production. Uh, with complex user interfaces, such as I believe all of Netflix.com is using it, Airbnb, parts of PayPal, parts of Yahoo, parts of Facebook themselves, I think all of Instagram.com, list goes on and on. And when it first came out, and this line has kind of stuck as one of their marketing lines, uh, React was marketed as just the V in the MVC. MVC, for people who don't know, stands for Model View Controller. It's an architectural pattern for designing our applications to make them easier to reason about. So since React is only concerned about the V or the view, it's only concerned about really what we see. It doesn't care about uh, how, we, like, how we get information to see it or what we're doing with that information necessarily. So since it's only, confused, or it's only concerned with the view, uh, we might immediately start thinking, well, is React just another templating engine? And it's not. It's much more than another templating engine. It can do much more than your standard templates. For instance, it can react to events. I mean, it can, regular templating systems cannot do that. So React can react to events. And because it can react to events, it can also handle state in some form or fashion. It actually has its own state handler built into it. And we'll get into that a little bit tonight. Another thing that's really nice about React that some uh, templating systems aren't so good at is that it can play really nice with other frameworks. So for instance, if you have a Backbone app or an Angular app, you can actually use React inside of them. A lot of, people's try to, a lot of people think that Angular and React are direct competitors, but you can actually use React inside of an Angular directive. You can actually use React inside of Backbone views. In fact, React can completely replace your Backbone views if you wanted to and still keep Backbone's model and collection handling. But probably one of the more powerful features that React brings is being able to build composable UIs through their component architecture. And so that's going to bring us to our first concept tonight, and that is thinking in components. So the first thing I want to do is to try and help visualize this is we're going to show a pretty simple little widget here. This is just a product search widget. You know, somebody 
put some input into there and it should just show a, a filter it and then show a list of products. This is actually, this screenshot and the next are actually taken from the Facebook uh, React documentation. So when we look at this really simple widget, we look at this view and we want to think about how would we build this in components as opposed to a template, we try and think of what are the smallest building blocks that we can break this down into. If we had to like make these little Lego reusable, reusable Lego pieces, what would they be? And it might look something like this. You could actually probably argue that you could break it down even further than this. But what we have here, just to walk through it a little bit, is we have wrapped around everything is our main, our main product search widget or our main product search component. Within there, we have a, a, maybe a generic search component and a specific product list component. So whenever someone types something in the search, it would send, send the data up to the product search component. Maybe that would filter against a list of products, and then that information would then be sent down to product list, which is currently, as you can see, a sibling of search. And once we get into product list, we see the real power of React here. We start seeing reusable components. We start seeing list header and product list item. And this is what we call composability. This whole chart, this whole thing is actually composability. What this is, is components made out of other components. You notice that we call it product search and you have these brackets and we'll get into those brackets here in a little bit. But uh, it's components made out of components, components all the way down. So it's something that we call composable. And that's a kind of a functioning, functional programming terminology. When you know function returns another function, all that kind of stuff is composable. But I want to look at components in another light. I want to take components and templates and put them in a street fight to find out who I think would win. So first, let's look at a typical handlebars template. This is a really simple template. All it does is take an array of objects called users, loops through them, grabs the name and the Twitter key, and then places them into the markup and spits out some HTML for the server to send to the client. Or it can happen on the client side as well. A few things to note here. Uh, this is a handlebars template, so we end up having these double curly brackets uh, that are pretty proprietary. If you don't know handlebars, you might not know what those mean, but that's sort of how you enact handlebar features within the markup. Uh, the hash there means a loop. Uh, that hash or pound sign means we're going to loop through this specific object that's user, which is an array of objects, rather, uh, called users. And then from inside there, we grab name and we grab Twitter, which are keys within any given object in that array. <coughs> so on the face of it, it looks really simple, but you still have to know these really specific things about handlebars and how it's working. In contrast, here's the same view but as a React component. So there's a few things happening here. First off, one thing we immediately notice, we're going top to bottom here, is that we immediately have a, a var, a variable. This is going to be reusable. We're storing something inside of here. And what are we storing? We're storing a function. I'm using ES6 uh, arrow functions here because I think we did that like last month or the month prior or something. So it shouldn't be too confusing, the syntax. So we're storing a function in here, so that's one thing that's really interesting compared to over here where we don't really know exactly what we're doing. It's not storing anything, but it is looping through something. But inside that function, we now see that we're using the native JavaScript map API. Uh, this is just uh, ES5 native JavaScript looping uh, uh, API that we all know and love. We're all here, JSMN. We know map. And within there, you know, map takes a function as an argument in there. For context, we'll use user so that each object uh, can be referenced as user. User.name, user.twitter. This is all pretty simple stuff. We've all seen this kind of thing before. And that's one of the reasons why React is so great is that instead of putting a proprietary or a underpowered programming language into markup, we've now put our markup into a more powerful programming language. 
and it allows us to do a lot of cool things and a lot of things that would be very difficult to do in a dumbed down uh, templating language like handlebars. Now, I say all that, but I know there's at least one of you I saw on Meetup uh, that is probably looking at this uh, React component, and this is probably your reaction. <clears throat> because you're thinking, wait a second, is that HTML in my JavaScript? I don't like that. Didn't we get away from that whenever you know, we moved away from PHP? And my answer to that is, <laughs> yes. It is HTML, but not really HTML. It's actually something called JSX. And JSX is a preprocessor on top of JavaScript that allows you to write this HTML-like, HTML-ish syntax inside of JavaScript. Really what it's doing is make, it's just going to transform back into pure JavaScript after we uh, compile or run React. You can actually write this entire template without any hard caret brackets if you want, but there are actually significant advantages to using JSX. Primarily, it's to help uh, a lot of non-technical, non-JavaScript people still be able to contribute to your projects. Any designer that maybe isn't, doesn't have the chops necessarily for uh, JavaScript, but is excellent at HTML and CSS, can still look at a React component and know, have some solid footing to work on and know what's going on. So they're still able to contribute and uh, help out with any given React component as far as pixel pushing and all of that. And that might be all great in all your thinking, you know, but the biggest problem, the biggest reason I have for hating what I just saw was that it messes with separation of concerns. We don't want to have our HTML in our JavaScript. And to that, I say, no, it's actually doing the right thing with concerns. It's bringing the concerns that matter together. And to explain why I say that, we need to first know about two concepts, one of which is coupling and another of which is cohesion. We may have, so coupling is the degree to which a module depends and relies on other modules within a program. So it's the relationship between two, three, four, or more modules and how they affect each other in different ways. If you have too high of coupling, you're gonna have one module that maybe makes a change here, but then that change might cascade down into multiple modules and make uh, changes to them that you weren't expecting. And it makes debugging very hard, it makes refactoring hard, it makes development a lot slower. We all know high coupling is bad. And just to give a visual of what high coupling might look like is this. Now, this is pretty obviously not a good architecture uh, to follow, right? This is impossible to follow, in fact. When you look at this, you're automatically going like this. <clears throat> so we don't want high coupling. It's bad. We want low coupling. We want our relationships between each module to be as minimal as possible. So that's coupling. The other concept is cohesion. And cohesion, on, in contrast to coupling, which is the relationship between modules, cohesion is about the elements uh, inside of a module and how much they actually belong to each other. So it's about what's inside the module mostly. So there's, the way I see it, there's two extremes to low cohesion. The most obvious extreme of low cohesion is when we have too many concerns within one module, one function, or what have you. This is what we usually see whenever uh, we have, we think of PHP spaghetti code. We have one file in PHP that has our markup, our display logic, our business logic, SQL queries, and all this crap that shouldn't necessarily be together. Um, and it, it makes looking at one module just as complex as high coupling might make looking at many modules. The other extreme of low cohesion is when you have, you could have low coupling and you could have a module that just has one concern within that module, but other things that it should be concerned with are also in another module. So it's actually split up. So the module itself might be very cohesive, you might think at first glance, but it's actually missing something. It's not being jarbled up with other things, it's just missing what should be there. 
So to give some visuals, this is your classic representation of low cohesion. Each module, you know, has circle squares, crosses, none, they don't have anything to do with each other. Why the heck are they in there? This has low coupling, right? The relationship between each one is low, but to understand each module, each box there is going to be hard to understand at first glance. On the other side, on the other side, you could have something like this, where each module itself is concerned about a circle. So that's great. But it would be better if we could have something like this, where we have one module that has all of our circles, and one module has all of our triangles, one module has all of our crosses. So they're all concerned with what they should be concerned about, and other modules are not concerned about those things as much. And so that's what the goal is. The goal is low coupling, high cohesion. And templating systems traditionally do give us very low coupling. That was the whole point, that's one of the points of templating systems is to decouple away from uh, our business logic and everything like that. But what they do, while they bring low coupling, they sacrifice cohesion. And the reason I say that is we have to realize that display logic, not business logic, not mutations to our data, but display logic, logic that is only concerned with our UI and our markup are implicitly coupled. They're implicitly linked and that they should be together because they're both concerned with the exact same thing. They both do the same thing ultimately, and that is they are concerned with the view, the DOM, right? What does markup do? Markup gets turned into HTML, which gets sent to the browser, which then turns into the DOM and DOM nodes. What does our display logic do? It runs on top of the DOM and the DOM nodes. It mutates, it manipulates the DOM nodes. Sometimes it takes data, true, and then it will send it back to a template which will then come back on top and manipulate the DOM again. They're, they're still talking to each other. They are implicitly linked together. And by separating them out from each other, to separate our display logic and our markup, we are lowering the cohesion of our ability to create user interfaces. So, like I said, templates do not separate concerns, they separate technologies for the most part. So I hope that we can now look at this React component and see that markup-like syntax and realize maybe you still don't like it, but I hope you can realize where people are coming from when they say they like this. Because what they're attempting to do here is lower the coupling between each module, between each component, while still bringing a highly cohesive component for us to use. So the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, that I tried to explain in that image at the beginning um, is composability. So let's take this exact same template here, or this same markup here, and see what this might look like if we try to compose this into many, many, uh, well, not many, many, but a few more components. It might look something like this. So what we've done here is we've broken up each part of that view of that markup into the smallest components that it could possibly be. And you could maybe argue you could break it down even more, but. So at the top, we have Twitter link, and then we have Twitter user, both of which are probably the simplest React components you can possibly make. It's just an anchor tag, and then Twitter user is just a p tag, and they both just render out some data. And these are highly reusable now. We can use these in more than just that view that we saw earlier. We, it's very easy for us to imagine using the Twitter link uh, component all throughout our app without having to rewrite it uh, every single time for every single view. So we can see what we're doing here with composing with Twitter user item. We can see it's just a div wrapping two other components and then we send in some data through what look like HTML attributes. And the real magic is really happening up here in Twitter user list, where we get back to our loop, where we're looping through our array of objects called users, and within there, it's just one component. We have name, you know, it's called Twitter user item, which is defined right above it. And it makes looking at Twitter user list very easy. We know what it's doing, right? It's loosely coupled to the Twitter user item. One thing I wanted to point out here that I think is pretty cool uh, 
on some level. I mean, you'd still have to do a lot of refactoring anyway, but check out what's happening with Twitter user list and what it's doing with Twitter handle equals curly bracket user dot Twitter curly bracket. So what that's saying is that the key in the object uh, for the Twitter value is just Twitter, user dot Twitter. That's the actual value. But we're sending it in to Twitter user item as Twitter handle, right? So now we can look at Twitter user item, right? And then we look within there, it's just a div wrapping to the other components. We see Twitter link. And then it says Twitter equals props dot Twitter handle. That's because we've sent the Twitter item as a prop. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious, like, so I look at this and it's like, you know, have you done this sort of thing in practice? Because like, yes. one thing I, I kind of wonder about this is it's like, to me it looks like it's just like a very highly specialized DSL that for domain specific language that, you know, people are going to have to be onboarded on to understand it and stuff like that. So I uh -huh. was like hesitant, like, where is that line? So Sure. So a few things I'll say to that. Yeah. Uh, one, as far as DSL is concerned, yeah. handlebars, all templates sure. are DSLs. Sure. All templates uh, are actually creating their own programming language. The only thing really special here about React as far as the looks of it, as far as the API, is you're, I think you're still getting hooked up on the Twitter, of the on the JSX, right? You're seeing this HTML in here and you're seeing the way it's passing in props. Well, the, I guess for me it's like I have to know what the interface is on a Twitter user item, right? Like, right. Well, you'd have to know what the user interface. Sure. You'd have to know what the interface is and what the data is on any given template, either, right? Because what we have right here, to be honest, is not much different. You could do this exact same uh, breakdown with template partials, and I would highly suggest you do that with template partials um, to create a more modular templating system. Right? You can make a template partial that is just an anchor tag that you can reuse, and it's called Twitter link dot handlebars, right? And then every time you want to use it inside of a, uh, another template, you would just call that partial. So that's so far with React, and what I've shown you with these really simple components, it's essentially the exact same thing as far as depend dependencies. Sure. Uh, as far as dependencies go with just running through data not necessarily dependencies going with display logic, because I haven't actually shown you React with real display logic yet. Um, but it's, this, that's essentially the same thing. If you had Twitter user item as a template, and then you had a partial called Twitter user item, and two partials called Twitter user and Twitter link, it looked very, 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 very similar to this. And you'd have that same link between them where you'd have to go, okay, now I have to look at Twitter user item. So I'd say there's not really too much of a difference there. As far as DSLs are concerned, um, other than the JSX, which I said is completely optional, and I don't have an example of what it looks like in raw JavaScript, because I personally right. think it looks <laughs> horrible, and I don't really it's just, it's like it. Calls. It's just function calls. It's, it's easy to understand if you're into JavaScript, but a lot of people, some people really like it in raw JavaScript, some people like it in JSX. I personally like it in JSX, because this is immediately familiar as far as something to grab a hold of. Uh, but it is just JavaScript. You can write it all in just JavaScript, and that's not a DSL. We all, I mean, it's a DSL of JavaScript, right? It has all the same functions and API as JavaScript has. Right, but you're, you're creating your own custom, you know, element, if you will, as opposed to just having divs and spans, which is another DSL, but it's a more... No, this creates divs and spans. Right, but, but as opposed to just saying, like, here are divs and spans, like, it's a lower level abstraction of the DSL versus... I'm not sure I'm following you on that. Uh, but, so, anyways, like I was saying, so this is what component composition looks like. It's just components made up of more components, and they're all reusable, and that's very handy in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, when you're building user interfaces. So like I said in this conversation, how this is, you could technically replicate something like this composition somewhat if you used a lot of template partials within your templating engine, there's another thing that React can do that I hinted at earlier, and that's that it can take, it can react to events and it can handle state. And that's what this might look like. 
So this time, we're no longer in a function, like here. We're not using ES6 fun arrow functions. We're using ES6 classes. The only time you would use the ES6 arrow functions in React is if you're writing a component that is just really returning markup. These are called stateless functional components. They don't have states, they're, function, they're functions, that's what they are. If you want to use state, if you want to manipulate state, or if you want to have uh, ability to use what React calls lifecycle hooks so that you can manipulate a React component based on whether it has mounted yet, whether it did mount, whether it's unmounted, and things like that, uh, you want to use the ES6 class, or they do have an ES5 compatible way of creating uh, React components, uh, and that is just called react.create class. So using ES6 classes here, we can see this is just more native JavaScript. We have our constructor, just like every other ES6 class, and that will handle our props or the data that gets passed into it. Super props and so that we can have better access to it. This dot state, so we can start defining our state, and our state is just defined as an object, just a plain old object. And this component in particular is just an increment counter. All it does is go up. So our state is count, and our initial count, I don't have it on here, but props.initial count would be some a uh, prop that you would either send into counter, or another thing that's nice about React is that you have the ability to set default props or default data for any given component. So if you don't send in data, uh, it can instead rely on a default, which is nice for certain views. So let's say our initial count is zero. So count equals zero right at the construction of our class. Then we go down and we see that inside of this class we have a function, it's just called tick, just ticks the count up. We can see that with this dot set state. This dot st set state is the state handler that React ships with. And it's pretty handy for small state changes within a component. And all this does is change the count up one. It just takes the current state and iterates it up one. Inside of our render function, we can see it just returns the JSX that we've already seen before, really. And it can take, so we have a div, and on the div it has an on click, and the on click is the function, this dot tick, all within the class. So far, this is pretty, other than the JSX, this is all native JavaScript. The only extra uh, API, really, in this whole thing is this dot set state. Otherwise, so far, other than the JSX and set state, this is all native JavaScript. And the clicks, it just shows this dot state dot count. So what this would do, if you were to run it, is show you a div with some text that would initially be zero. As soon as you click that zero, it'd go one, you click it, and go two. Just incrementing state. So I hope that you guys can look at these components and see some of the benefits, even if you don't necessarily agree with them, you can see why some people would, in fact, like to use them. Uh, they can make composable inter user interfaces. They bring together a loosely coupled system with high cohesion. They can handle state and events that templates cannot do. And so, for me personally, in the fight between templates and components, I think, components win. So that's it for our first concept of thinking in components. What we want to now go to is the second concept that is in React that heavily affects how you develop in it. And that is that we don't mutate, we re-render. So to understand this, we must realize that view is a function of state. That basically means that our UI, our DOM, our view, or whatever, represents a particular state at any given time. Uh, a lot of frameworks agree with this, Angular, Backbone, everybody, really. Uh, you have things called view models, right? And the view model is just your application UI layer's state at any given time. It tells you what should be displayed. It's not business logic, it's just display logic. But the problem with this is, is that state changing over time is hell because it's incredibly hard to track these 
state changes as they move through time and change and change the inputs with, that go into functions, we can't guarantee all the time that, through, especially through user inputs and things like that, that the state will necessarily be uh, clean or a good snapshot. And as we mutate more and more, we get a further and further away from that one specific snapshot in time that our minds are so used to thinking in. And to sort of explain what I mean by this, uh, we need to go back in time to the late 1990s. So back in the 90s, state was a lot easier to handle. I guess early 2000s, too. Uh, it was a lot easier to handle. Uh, all we had were real static pages. Every single user interaction basically just refreshed the page. You hit a link, goes back to the server, runs through some data, sends you a snapshot of the data mixed that is represented in the HTML, and there you have it. You fill out a form, you hit the submit, goes back to the server, server sends you back to some HTML and a route, there you have it. These were static pages, they weren't dynamic. The state was always a snapshot in time. You didn't change it, really. But we can't do that back in 2016, right? We have our customers demand rich user interfaces. We have to make dynamic applications. Otherwise, we will lose as developers. Our companies will go under. Our customers demand these things. And because they demand these things, we, the rise of the single page application started to happen because we needed this dynamic like experience. But that just meant that state became harder and harder to manage because it got further and further away from the snapshot of the official data that was sent by the server. And now we, have to, now we find that we need to start handling all of that data in the DOM itself, or in the DOM or just in JavaScript on the client itself and basically remaking a, a, the database itself on the client just so that we can handle it. So, what's the solution? What do we do here? State changing over time sucks, but we can't go back to the late 1990s because we hated that, PHP, right? So what's the solution? Well, it turns out the solution is to party like it's 1999. We do want to do this. We do want to go back to that. It was way easier. Why would we not want to make our lives as developers easier? So why don't we try and re-render everything every time the state changes? Just do a re-render. Everything just changes. Why can't we do that? Because it would be slow, right? The DOM is notoriously slow. We, we could never actually do this if we were actually mutating and blowing away, if we were actually blowing away the actual DOM, it wouldn't work. You'd, you'd lose your scroll position. Right? You'd type a letter into a form and it would disappear. So the solution here actually is to re-render everything, to blow it all out and re-render it, but not on the actual DOM. Instead, we want to do it on what's called the virtual DOM. And this is something that, well, it's a concept that has been floated around before, but Facebook implemented a virtual DOM into React. And what a virtual DOM is, is just a JavaScript representation of what the DOM is at any point in time, right? So it's a blueprint for the DOM. It tells, that's what all that JSX is doing, guys. That's, what's all, that's why we're defining our markup in here. So we can define our DOM structures in JavaScript so we can have a JavaScript representation of the DOM that then anytime state changes, we can create a new JavaScript representation of the DOM and diff them. And through that diff, we can calculate the minimal number of mutations that need to happen to the actual DOM. And we can batch them together and execute those changes, all those mutations at one time for optimal optimization, optimal optimization, uh, to, and also to uh, minimize thrashing. So that's that's really what the virtual DOM does and why it's so awesome and why we need to have our markup in our JavaScript because it gives us this power to now, well, it's the next slide. <laughs> it gives us a lot of cool benefits.
for one, it's relatively fast out of the box, actually. You know, you think of re-rendering everything and blowing everything away, uh, you immediately think that's really slow. And you are completely correct if that's the DOM itself. But JavaScript is actually pretty fast when doing these computations. It's just a tree that dips. It also allows us to write components declaratively. And what I mean by that is that the components themselves just describe the UI at any given time. We don't necessarily say how we should make the UI, just what the UI is. That's what those render functions are. Inside render, it's just what looks like markup. It just says, this is what this component is. Just like a server rendered app. Speaking of server rendered apps, it allows us server-side rendering. This is really, really neat, right? Because now, I haven't done Angular very much, but I know that back, they may have fixed this, but back in the day, uh, if you wanted to have SEO on Angular, you pretty much had to run it in like a headless browser. If a Google bot visited your page, you needed to send them a, uh, an HTML payload because Google couldn't see your regular Angular app on the client side, right? And that caused a lot of overhead because you can't do that for every single time the Googlebot tries to visit your site, right? So that's one benefit that we get here with server-side rendering with React. We get immediate SEO benefits because React ships with a uh, two-string and, two, and minimal markup, right? So it can just send an, the React payload as an HTML string or whatever to the browser to immediately render on the client side. And then afterwards, once the JavaScript is downloaded, it'll just bind the events necessary for React to work for interaction. So you get that immediate, you get SEO benefits and you get immediate, uh, you, know, you don't get any flash fun style content, basically. And this is, it's the other thing that's really nice about this is, it's the exact same code that's being used on the client that's being used on the server. So you're not writing two different code bases for server and client. You're not using a templating engine to create an HTML payload to your client and then using jQuery widgets on top of it to mutate. You don't have two different things concerned with your display. You just have React. It's the same code. This is called isomorphic or the now general consensus is universal JavaScript. We'll see next year if they call it something else. It depends um, on how much you care about routing. Um, you don't necessarily have to. Um, it depends. You probably would only use routing if you do have a single page application. You can use React without a single page application, right. and it would work just fine. Well, um, And it just goes to the home page, right? Yeah, or blank screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so you can, so you definitely can use it. You can use it with routing. Um, we'll get into routing here in a little bit. Well, the second half of the talk. But basically, you can use React Router to render on the server side, and it can then use. You can use the context in the URL there to get those benefits. It's pretty tricky to set up, <laughs> admittedly, but it is possible. Um, the other thing that the virtual DOM lets us do, since we no longer need a headless browser, is that we get certain testing capabilities for free baked right into it. So some of you guys might be having unit tests, and in order to properly unit, unit test them, for every test you're firing up PhantomJS or Selenium or WebDriver or whatever uh, in order to simulate a browser uh, to run your test. You don't actually have to do that anymore because you have the representation of what the DOM actually is going to be, a, be for any given component, for any given view, right there in the virtual DOM. So React, you, React actually ships uh, testing utilities. Well, it's, it's an add-on. Um, so that you can actually look into the virtual DOM and make your assertions against that. So that's another cool thing about, Re about the virtual DOM. So that's what I have 
for the first half of this talk for components and the virtual DOM. We're going to take a five minute break and then we'll come back and talk about the ecosystem that has popped up around React. Uh, it's mostly going to be about the data management uh, side of things, but we will talk about route routing a little bit, styling even less, and then we'll talk about uh, how I think, if you're looking into using React, um, how and when you should use it. So, it's a five minute break.